But uh, we're going to go ahead and turn to Matthew 28. Uh, We'll be looking at verses 19 and 20, at least to start with there. Um, Familiar verses, of course. Uh, Just about every missionary preaches on these. But uh, hopefully we'll we'll be able to uh, cover some ground that maybe you haven't heard before. Um, Right now, we're hearing a lot about things in this world, and they don't sound good. Uh, Pastor was preaching on that on Sunday night, and absolutely right, and we need to be aware of all this stuff and all this. However, there is something we need to understand. Most churches these days, they have gotten the attitude of, uh, you know, the song, Hold the Fort. Uh, I had a, I knew a preacher one time that uh, he would not allow that song to be sung in his church. He said, too many Christians are just holding the fort, but we're to press the battle is what it is. There is a battle going on, and we need to be co- continuing on and, and pressing forward uh, for the mark, the prize, the high calling of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to be reaching this world for Christ. Uh, Hold the Fort is uh, it's a good song, but uh, the attitude of, you know, hey, we just got to hold ground and everything. No, we're the victors. We're on the winning side. We sing that song, too. Uh, well, we just need to keep being faithful to the Lord, uh, this world and how bad it gets does not change our responsibility or the mission of the church. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but we have this great commission that's in Matthew 28. We'll go ahead and read there. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now let's pray before the message. Our Father in heaven, Lord, as we open up your word, we need your presence tonight. We need your Holy Spirit to come and speak to us, Lord. We don't need to hear from man. We need to hear from you. And I just pray that you'd be with me and and just give me the words to say, uh, Lord, uh, I don't uh, do this for my own... uh, to lift myself up, Lord, uh, we want to lift up Jesus Christ. That's You're the only one that matters, and that's why we're here tonight. And I just pray that you'd be with us and meet with us now. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Okay, the Great Commission. Uh, we've heard plenty of preaching. Just about every missionary that comes through preaches on these verses, and you know, there's a few other passages. Uh, we're going to touch on a lot of those tonight. But uh, the reality is that... The job isn't done. Let me ask this. Have we reached this entire world for Jesus Christ? Are there still lost people out there to be reached with the gospel? Then we're not done. And so we need we need to be reminded about this. We need to continue on. Uh, The church's mission is to go out into this world and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And that mission will not end until Christ returns. So we need to be faithful to do our job. Uh, But My question tonight is, where is our burden for reaching this world for Jesus Christ? You know, every day we we get caught up in this world and we see the stuff going on. It it has a tendency to get us sidetracked, get us distracted, get us uh, off worrying about other things. But the reality is we need to be winning this world for Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 19 said, Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So who's this verse addressed to? And I know this is, you know, we, you've probably heard this a thousand times. It's addressed to ye. Anyone know, yeah, we, we talk about the King James Bible and, you know, how all the these and the thous and everything. What does ye mean? Well, ye means you, but it's in the plural. We don't have that in English today. In English today, you say you, it could be plural, it could be singular or anything. Well, in Old English, ye was specifically the plural of you. So that doesn't just mean you, one person, like the person that the Lord was speaking to, but ye, it was a group of people. It was more than, uh, it was three or more at least. Um, so we have that here. It's addressed to the whole group. Who was the group that he was speaking to at that time? They were the disciples. Not only the 12, but, but the, just the, the, all the believers at that time saying, you need to do this. And he was giving a mission to the church, to the, the believers that were there at, when he, he rose up into heaven. That, this is when he was t- speaking to them, is right before his ascension into heaven. But then the question is, where do we go to? 
And of course, the answer is all nations. It, it's not just here in America that we need to be concerned with. It's this entire world that is our, our mission field. Now, we have to be aware that every time we walk outside the doors of this church, we are in the mission field. You know, we, we think of, you know, oh, well, America, it's a Christian nation. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's been a long time since it's been a Christian nation. It was at one time, but not anymore. Uh, but even, even if that were true, that doesn't mean that everyone is saved. We still have a mission field. We still need to go across the street to our neighbors to, to get them the message of salvation that Jesus Christ still does save. So we, we have to go to all nations. We have to go to our neighbors. And we have to go to the uttermost part of the earth, the Bible says. Uh, we have a responsibility to the Dominican Republic or to Africa or to uh, Russia or to um, uh, Japan, where I, I served a little while as a missionary there. All these places, we, we need to be reaching them with the gospel. And we do that through the missions, uh, our missions program. So then we're to go something... So, in another way as well. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. You know, in these two verses, that word teach appears twice. And both times, it's teach two different things. The first teach here, you'll notice when, uh, when we read it in the verse there, it comes before doing something else. What's the something else? Baptizing. That's right. So what do you do before you're baptized? You have to be saved. This is the preaching of the gospel is what it's talking about here. This is going out with the message that's in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that's our mission field, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the message that we're to get out. That is the message, the only message that saves. So we're to teach all nations and, and we, we have a responsibility to go to this entire world. Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I heard somebody say this, uh, say it this way. Do you want to know if you should witness to somebody? Check and see if they're breathing. If they're breathing, witness to them. Uh, it's a pretty good uh, uh, standard to go by. Uh, we are to preach the gospel to every creature, not just the ones that want to hear it. Not just the ones that are uh, receptive or you think, oh, you know, that person looks like they'd make a good Christian. Well, what about the ones that look like they'd make a horrible Christian? Preach them too. You never know what God might do in their lives. Uh, I've seen that many times where God really changed somebody and turned their life around. But uh, we're to preach the gospel to every creature. John 4.35, we we're warned by the Lord Jesus. It says this, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. There is a harvest out there. There are people out there that need to hear about Jesus Christ that will respond even in this world today. That They will get saved if we'll go and preach the gospel to them. I've been very encouraged by the amount of growth that we've seen in our church recently, and it's awesome. It's great. But at the same time, I'm a little bit discouraged as well. Because if you look at all the people that have been coming into the church and, and visiting and, and joining the church, and that's great, but they're already believers. Where are the unbelievers? Where are the people who are new converts, the ones that, oh, we've had a couple uh, Tanaz got saved not, not long ago. You know, there's others that have gotten saved recently and praise God for that. But we ought to see more than that. There, there is a harvest out there. It's white already to harvest. We need to be out there witnessing, telling people about Jesus Christ. There's someone who wants to listen. But when was the last time we prayed and said, Lord, lead me to that someone? Give me the opportunity. Uh, we, you know, we think, oh, yeah, I, I'm going to try and witness and everything. And we go to work and we talk a little bit about the Lord and everything. And that's great and everything. But ask the Lord to do something in someone's heart. Be praying. I mean, really praying. Maybe even, uh, and I know uh, I'm going to uh, step on some toes here, but maybe even fast a little bit over that. Say, you know, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, uh, Give up eating for an entire day just, just because I want to see you do a job, do your work, the Holy Spirit, do his job and, and work in the heart of someone that they might be saved. Uh, we'll talk more about prayer in a moment. 
But uh, so we're to teach all nations and then baptizing them. That's something that is a, a, a important thing as well. You know, when you get someone saved, when you preach to them, they, they trust in Jesus Christ. The first thing you need to get them to do is, is agree to be baptized. And because and, a lot of people, they're trusting in the wrong things. They're trusting in their baptism. They're trusting in, you know, oh, well, I, yeah, when I was a baby, they baptized me. And no, uh, or, you know, the Church of Christ, they, they teach that you have to be baptized by the Church of Christ in order to be saved. And if you're not baptized by them, then you're not really saved. Uh, just baptism is important. It needs to be scriptural. It needs to be, uh, first of all, the word baptism is, uh, in the Greek, baptizo, is, uh, it, it's a word that literally means to immerse. So sprinkling or pouring, no, that's not what the Bible talks about. It was by immersion, and it was by, for believers only. That's what baptism is. So we, we need to get them baptized. But uh, th this whole mission, the, the whole thing that, that's going on here, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ is commissioning us, it's to go out into this world to reach people for Jesus Christ. The um, entire New Testament is a book of missions. You know, we read through the Bible and we don't really think about that, but that's the reality of it. There was the church in Jerusalem, and then uh, the, that church uh, was persecuted, and the believers went out from that church, and just through the persecution, they were scattered around, and they started churches wherever they were, but it was just them in those churches uh, until the time of the Apostle Paul. And there were, and Peter did some work, and, you know, there was Philip. There, there were others as well, but, but in particular, the Apostle Paul, he went out, and he started reaching people in other lands, starting churches out there, and then he would move on someplace else. That's missions. And when you look at the churches that are mentioned in the Bible and the ones to which the epistles are all written, in fact, the, the entire New Testament was written to mission works. Those churches, they, they were started by a missionary, either Paul or someone else, because uh, there, there were a few of the churches there that Paul just, he went and worked in those churches at, at times, but he didn't start them. They, they were all mission works. The New Testament is a book of missions. That's what it's all about. If we miss that, then we, you know, we say, oh, well, you know, it's just, it's about the church, and it's just about us here that are in the church and everything. No, there is always an outward look to the end of the world. That, that, was, that was the point behind much of what was written in the New Testament. All of this was guidance to these churches that were started out on the mission field. That needs to be our focus. E even in, um, you know, in terms of missionaries, and, and I appreciate our, our many missionaries that, that uh, we have, and you, know, you can look at uh, the back wall uh, out there and see all, all their prayer letters and everything. I really appreciate what they do, and a lot of them are going out and starting churches and everything, and that's wonderful. But I've seen many missionaries go out essentially to, they, they go someplace, maybe they even start the church, but then they just stay there and basically they pastor the church. That's not really missions. It, missions is going out like Paul did, it, or like with um, what, he, what he told Titus, which I'm getting ahead of myself now, but um, he, he went out, he started a church, and then he went on to someplace else because it was what we believe in, the local nationals, that he was handing it over to them saying, this is your church now. I'm going to go over someplace else where the need is is also great help them out but you guys have to just be self-supporting and go on and do the work here that is the goal of missions it, it's not to have something that that uh, i go out and i start a church and you know when i die the church dies no the idea is to go out and start a church that will be self-sufficient that will continue on after we're gone that's what, what's going on here. That, that's what goes on in the New Testament. These churches, they, they continued on even after Paul was executed. But the uh, entire church, or the entire New Testament, like I said, is a book of missions. But realistically, missions should be the burning passion of every believer, every believer in Christ. Uh, if you really understand the plight of this world, you know, we, we look out and we say, you know, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, the gospel has gone out into this world and people have heard about Jesus Christ. No, not really. Uh, I spent 
three years over in Japan, and there were many people over in Japan that have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ apart from an American movie. That's, that's all they know about Jesus Christ. And if that's all you know, that's not knowing very much. So, are they okay? No, absolutely not. They need to be saved as well. And if we don't go to them with the gospel, they're eternally lost. Say, oh, well, you know, Brother Bill, God will have mercy on them, certainly. No. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So it's saying that everything, if you look out into the world, if you look at what's uh, available for them to know and, and see and everything, that they are responsible for knowing that God exists and responsible for essentially for seeking him out. And if they don't do that, the verse goes on, so that they are without excuse. In John 3.18, it says, He that believeth on him, speaking of Jesus Christ, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. The world is lost out there. In the deepest, darkest depths of Africa, where they have never even heard of Jesus Christ or the Bible or a missionary or anything like that, they are still lost. Do we even care? They, they have not even had the chance to listen and hear the gospel. Well, then you might say, well, Brother Bill, you know, we're just, we're not a big church. What can we do? Let me tell you a story about a church. It was a small church. In the early 1700s, uh, there was a group, small community of persecuted, uh, they were Protestant believers, they weren't Baptist, uh, but, uh, but they were believers, they, they were truly born-again Christians. Uh, they were from a couple of places, they were from Moravia and Bohemia, and they were believers that had, the gospel had been passed on to them uh, starting out in the 1400s with a, a man by the name of Jan Hus. He was uh, a former Catholic priest, that had gotten saved and started essentially pre preaching the gospel, preaching against the Catholic Church, and he was burned at the stake for what he believed. But he had some followers, and those followers continued on until the 1700s. But they had been under persecution. There were only a few of them left, and they were traveling around what later became Germany. Uh, and they came upon a, 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 a particular count that was there, that he also had trusted in Jesus Christ as his savior. His name was Count Zizendorf. And these persecuted believers came to him and said, you know, hey, we hear you, you know Christ. Well, so do we, and we want the opportunity to just live out our Christian faith someplace, you know, where we're not going to be persecuted. He said, I agree with you. I'm going to give you this town, Herrenhut was the name of the town, said, I'll give you this town and you can, you can live your lives and everything. And he was very involved. He actually became the leader of this group at, at that point. But um, th they, they settled this town and they started living for the Lord and preaching the gospel and that was great. But it was just that one town until something happened. <clears throat> Count Zizendorf went up to, um, he, he was going to see a coronation for the king of Denmark. Uh, the, it was King Christian VI. And uh, while he was there, he met a slave. This slave was, uh, his master had brought him over there for the coronation and everything, but he was from St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. And uh, he had come over to Europe, and Count Z Zizendorf met this man who said, hey, while I was here in Europe, I came to know Christ as my savior. And I'm really concerned about all my fellow slaves back in St. Thomas, that, that no one is preaching to them. They don't know Jesus Christ as their savior. And, well, Count Zizendorf was, was really burdened about it, so he brought this slave back to the town in order to speak to the people that were there. And one evening they, they, uh, they were talking about what was going on there, and, and uh, the man's name was Anthony Ulrich. And Anthony gave his testimony and then told them all about the slaves and what their plight was and the fact that they didn't know Christ. Well, the church came under conviction. Mind you, the church was the entire town at that time. And there were about 300 people there, and they, they came under conviction. In fact, a few of them spent a sleepless night there and came back the next day and said, we believe the Lord would have us go to St. Thomas to uh, to." 
preach the gospel to these people. And the church said, that's a great idea. And they decided to send two of them all, uh, over to the Caribbean to do that. Well, this was, there was no such thing as an organized mission program at this point. It, that didn't exist. And so Count Zizendorf and the church, they said, okay, great. We're going to send you and have a nice time. <laughs> they just sent him out the door. Count Zizendorf, uh, he took them uh, all the way to the, the uh, partial way to the, the port where they were going to uh, be take ship over to the Virgin Islands. And he gave them a little bit of money and said, you know, all right, go preach the gospel to these folks. And they just went by faith not knowing how they were going to make a living, how they were going to uh, exist there at all. Well, they went and they preached the gospel there, and many of the slaves got saved. Many of the people there got, sla uh, got saved. It, it, was, it was incredible what the Lord did. But just months after that, they said, well, that was great. Let's send somebody up to uh, Greenland to go preach to the Inuit up there. And then let's send somebody over to India and to Africa and to this place and to that place. And they sent people all around the world. This little church within a very, very short time, just a matter of years, ended up sending hundreds, perhaps even a thousand or more missionaries to every part of the world. All before uh, William Carey went to India, uh, Adoniram Judson went to Burma, any of this. This is what was going on here. In fact, it was missionaries that were going to the colony of Georgia, these Moravian missionaries, that were the ones who led uh, John Wesley to Christ. You know, you may have heard of Wesley, uh, him and his brother Charles, and Whitfield, all three of them. It was the involvement of the Moravians that, that had that influence on them that brought them to Christ. This little church, what can a little church do? This church <laughs> literally reached the world for Jesus Christ. And this is in the early 1700s. Those first two missionaries that they sent out, that was in August of 1732 when that, when that happened. They went out there. Now, mind you, they, they were not doctrinally on the same page as us. I'm not, you know, saying, you know, oh, we need to be Moravians. No, we, we need to hold to our own doctrine. The, 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 stick with the Bible. They relied a lot on uh, their feelings and a lot on their traditions and everything like that. Stick with the Bible. That's what we do. The, the, you want to know what it means to be a Baptist? It's right here. We stick to this book. And all, all the other groups and everything, they go off and just, they, a lot of times it's, you know, well, we feel this is right. Or, you know, hey, this is the way, you know, my parents did it. Or No. Stick with the word of God. All right. So the, this church, they started reaching out to this the entire world, this little church, this church of 300 people. Uh, now, mind you, it grew from there, but, uh, but that's where they were when this all started. We can have an impact on this world. There is no question about that. But that, the verses that we're looking at today, let's look at verse 20. We looked at verse 19, but now it says this teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Lord goes on there, and he, says, he uses the word teaching. We already mentioned the first teach was talking about salvation. But this word teaching is talking about something different. It says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You see, it's far more, hey, you get saved, that's great. But that's not the end of the Christian life. There's a whole lot more you need to learn, a whole lot more you need to do. And that is our responsibility with these new believers is to reach them with the gospel, but then go on and disciple them as well, is what we call it. So we're, the mission goes beyond ev evangelism, seeing people saved. You know, that's part of what happened with, uh, you know, uh, we think of Billy Graham and how great, you know, Billy Graham was. Uh, people always talk about, oh, Billy Graham this, Billy Graham that. Well, Billy Graham had some problems, you see, and it had to do with this very verse. You see, he was real big on preaching the gospel, and I thank God for every soul that was saved as a result of his ministry. But then that's all he ever did with them. He never took them from there. When, when they responded to uh, the, the call for salvation after he preached the message what, during the invitation time and everything, they'd come forward and they would have just about anyone deal with them at the altar, the Catholics, the Mormons, you know, everybody, you know, not just believers uh, like 
we would consider believers in Christ. Uh, and, and he just kind of let them do their own thing. You know, hey, I preached the gospel and they got saved. That's all that matters. Well, it's not all that matters. There's a lot more to it. There's a lot more to uh, discipleship than just getting saved. And uh, we need to be teaching people to live for the Lord, to put him first in their lives, and, and in, to be able to reach others for Jesus Christ. It, just leaving them, them there is not helping them a great deal. Uh, they need to be you know, involved with starting churches that, that carry on that same doctrine and faith that we, we hold dear. Uh, that's, that's our responsibility. That's what this verse is talking about, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever, whatsoever I have commanded you. You know what? That's what the Moravians did too. You know, when they sent those people over there and, and the missionaries went and they, they got people saved, uh, when they got the first few people saved wherever they went to, they referred to them as the first fruits. But those first fruits, their, their desire was, yeah, they get them saved, but then they wanted to train them up to reach others and to start churches and, and to do the work so that this way it was their own people reaching them for Christ. Because they felt that, hey, that's more effective than some European going over to this place and, and preaching the gospel to them. If, if their own people are telling them about Jesus Christ, that carries more weight than if I go over and do it. Well, again, that's the national pastor concept. They were actually doing this back in the 1700s. Uh, in fact, you know what? It wasn't even original to them. It's in here. That's exactly what Paul did. It's exactly what Paul told uh, Titus to do. Uh, they, they were there in the 1700s. They, they were, uh, you know, the beginning of modern missions, if you will. They were reaching the na native population and then helping them to go on and reach their own people. Titus 1.5, uh, Paul says this to Titus. He says, for this cause left I thee in Crete. So he said, ah, oh, Titus, I left you in Crete for a purpose that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. He said, all right, I want you to go out. I don't want you necessarily to go pastor in some other place. I want you to go out and appoint elders. And, and you need to go find the believers there, maybe preach the gospel to them so they get saved. And then they're the ones who are going to do the work there. My burden when I was going over to Japan, what I wanted to do, uh, I, I wanted to, my, my desire was to go out and start churches uh, from our church there at Yokota. Uh, I was going to go out and, and start churches in other places in Japan, but I wanted to find somebody who, was, um, who we could train up to be a pastor, a Japanese man, and then I would go with them, start the church, and they would, from the beginning, be the pastor, and that they would do the work. I was just there to, to give them a helping hand and show them what to do and, and all that. That's what we were to do. That's what missions is supposed to be about, is going out there, getting those people saved, and getting them to do the work, not us. All right, so... That's the idea that, that is, is taught in the, in the New Testament here. But then what is our responsibility and burden? Um, turn with me over to Matthew chapter 9. You don't have to keep your place here. Uh, we're done with Matthew 28. But in Matthew t chapter 9, we're going to look at uh, another familiar passage. It says in verses 37 through 38, <clears throat> this is the Lord speaking to his uh, uh, to his disciples here and says then he saith unto his disciples the harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few pray ye therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest so remember what we said about the harvest that the fields are white already unto harvest that there are people out there that are ready to get saved if we'll just go to them in the power of the holy spirit and, and go to them and preach the gospel to them that's absolutely true Excuse me. He said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already unto the harvest. The need is already very great. But do you notice what he said to them? He said, look. That was the problem. They weren't looking. We need to look. We need to go out there. We need to have a vision for what's going on all around us. A vision for those who need Christ. A vision for those who, who are we see each and every day, you see, the world will blind you to that mission. The world will, they'll keep you so busy 
and caught up in, you know, oh, you know, well, I, I, you know, I've got to go out and have a good time and I got to work for a living and I got to do this and I got to do that. And they'll keep you blind to all of that. We need to go beyond that and look at what the actual need is out there. When you remember that each and every person that you meet every day is a soul that will spend eternity either in heaven or hell. And that the Lord himself has commissioned each of us to make the difference in their life. To preach the gospel to them. And, and realize that if we don't, that there is no hope for them. Uh, when you get a burden for that, then you're going to do something for the Lord. You're gonna do. Some, you're gonna. You're gonna have the the burden for people. So you're you're not going to leave them like like David was left in Psalm 142 verse four. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. There are so many out there that could say that very thing. No man cares for me. You know, uh, and that's really that that's the thing that uh, in this generation that's out there right now that that. That's what they're saying all the time is no one cares. You know, uh, the, and rightly so, they say even the church doesn't care because most churches, really, they don't. They, they, uh, they're either caught up in their own things or they're uh, just, you know, more concerned about, you know, oh, got to have the right standards and everything, you know. And, and they get caught up in these side issues instead of looking unto the fields that they're white already unto harvest, that there are souls out there that are seeking. They're looking for something. They want to find some truth in this world. And, you know, that, that's, there's not much of that to go around right now. But we have the truth, and we need to get it out to them. And they'll respond. Many of them will respond if they see your heart and they know that, that what you have is real and that you want to share it with them, they'll respond to that. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we need to pray. We need to be praying. Pray, pray, pray. And when you're done with that, pray. Pray. Who is the Lord of the harvest that's mentioned here in this verse? Well, that's, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's the Lord of the harvest. And it says, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. What, what does that mean? That the Lord doesn't, you know, oh, I, I wouldn't think of sending somebody out except, you know, somebody reminds me in prayer. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, look, I'm going to send people in response to, to you asking me. If you don't bother to ask, then obviously you don't care, so I'm not going to send them. How many missionaries aren't sent because we back here never asked? We back here aren't praying for them. How, how, how many, what work could be done if we really got a burden and started praying? And you know, that, that church, I, I keep referring back to the church there uh, in, uh, with Count Zins Zizendorf and uh, the church there at Herrenhut. Um, do you know what they did when they got a burden to pray? In, um, and I didn't write down the date, but it was 1820, or 1727. Uh, I forget the, the actual uh, month and day, but there was a specific time, a specific date that they started this. They started praying 24-7. They took shifts. They kind of broke it up. So, you know, okay, you know, um, Jack, you pray at this time. And Chris, you pray at this time. And Sean, you pray at this time. And Brother Chris, you pray at this time. And, um, you know. And they broke it up, and they all took turns praying and everything. And they prayed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Do you know how long they did it for? Over 100 years that went on. What can we do? We can pray. <laughs> I, I, this little church, they prayed for 100 years. That's generation after generation after generation. And look what the Lord did with them. We, God can use us, but we have to have the heart. We have to have the, the willingness. We have, need to be, do you want that kind of revival right now? And I believe revival is possible. If not on a national scale, at least in our church, at least in our community, it can happen. And besides, if you want to know, oh, could it happen on a national level? Well, look at the Bible. 
What does the Bible say? Uh, absolutely. Uh, in, in the book of uh, uh, Second Kings and Second Chronicles, we have an individual by the name of King Josiah. And these were in the last days right before they went into the Babylonian captivity. And I know I've told you this before, but, but during those last days, they had revival in the, times of, in the time of King Josiah. Now, it was a temporary thing. It was just God said, look, my judgment's going to fall. There is no stopping it. But because you sought me, it's not going to be in your time. It's going to be after you're gone. And they had revival during those days. Would that we could have that. But if not on a national level, even if, you know, all right, forget about that for a moment. Let's have it here. Let's have the Lord do something here. Let's see some souls saved. Let's see the Lord do a work in our hearts, in our families, in our homes. And uh, We need to be giving ourselves over to prayer. We need to give ourselves over to the Lord. Uh, and, and speaking of giving, that's the next thing that we, we can do. We can give so that others can go. You know, we, we can give, you know, in Philippians 4, verses 15 through 17, Paul was speaking to the believers there. Now ye Philippians know also that, at, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. You know, there are missionaries out there on the field that need our support, our help, uh, and all that. Uh, not only are they uh, the Americans that have gone over to these mission fields, but also the national pastors that we support. And uh, Brother uh, Rebaldera, he's going there to reach his own people and everything. We have people out there that are doing that work, but they need help. They need our support. That, you know, uh, in when we went to Dominican Republic, uh, the folks that we met there and everything, most of them, I mean, they have no income. You know, they, they might get a few bucks here and there, you know, depending upon what they do and everything. But the reality is, you know, they, they, if they have a goat in the backyard and, you know, a couple of chickens maybe and, you know, a little plot of ground that they have uh, a few vegetables and everything, they, they think that's, that life is good. You know, that, that's all there is to it and everything. You know, would that some... Americans could get that kind of uh, a vision for life that, you know, we don't have to have the latest iPhone or something like that, you know, that, that we're just content with what we have, you know, but, but no, we always have to have more. Well, over there, even though it doesn't take much to live, it takes something to live and to be able to reach people and to build buildings and everything. Uh, we, we already gave so that we could build a building down there in the B Dominican Republic. Uh, Pastor Marilus, uh, he, he has a church now because you gave. And that praise God for that. But it doesn't stop there. We don't say, oh, well, we built one church. We've done our job. We've, uh, that's great. No, that, <laughs> like the old saying, you know, what have you done for me lately? You know, that, that was then. It's now. Let's keep giving. So takes money to do the Lord's work no matter where you are. Uh, you know, in some com countries, you know, they, they don't even allow foreigners. It, so if an American goes over there, uh, they don't allow them to work for a living. So they have to be entirely supported from outside or they just don't eat, you know. So it, it's important that we, we give. But then there's something else we can do. We can go. You know, go maybe temporarily, go on a mission trip to uh, Mexico or to the Dominican Republic. You know, uh, we have those opportunities here in our church to go and do that. You know, and you, it's not just go over there and see the mission field, but to take part in it, to go out and hand out John and Romans. Maybe to uh, uh, my church over in England when I was stationed over there, that's the church where I got saved, uh, we did mission trips over to Romania, and I went on two of them. And what we did is we went over there and we taught vacation Bible school. We had a couple of translators that uh, were available to us over there, and we, we actually taught the kids and did crafts with them and took them out and we played games with them and, and we had children saved, we had parents saved, we had uh, churches started and, uh, through that ministry just because we were, went on this one week trip over to Romania. Uh, God can use you, you know, uh, be willing to go. 
Uh, we have a responsibility to this world, Acts 1.8. We're all familiar with that verse. But ye shall receive power after the, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we're to go out. We're to go to our neighbors, and we're to go out to uh, the uh, countries around us. And we're to go to the uttermost part of the earth. Uh, we're to be willing to be used by God. Go on mission trips. Maybe God might even call you to the mission field. Say, oh, well, Brother Bill, you know, I'm, I'm too old to go over there, you know. Well, some of the uh, greatest missionaries that have ever gone have been people who are retired and, and just say, you know, hey, uh, I've got, you know, maybe you have some, you know, you're blessed to have like a pension or something. There are places you can go to in the world that it doesn't take a whole lot of money to live. And you can take that money and you can go there. You might not even need support. But even if you do, God has used people, you know, in, in the latter part of their life many times. Or you say, well, you know, Brother Bill, I'm, I'm too young. I've got a family. I've got kids. <laughs> Isn't that what uh, Israel said when they were coming out of Egypt and they were supposed to go into the promised land and they were at Kadesh Barnea? And uh, they said, oh, we can't go in there. We've got the children here. We have to protect them. And there's giants in the land. And the, it's dangerous out there. Lord, you know, what, what are you thinking? And what did God say? Okay, you're not going in. Your children will go in. Forty years they wandered in the wilderness because of it until finally they had all died off and the children went in. God can use you even if you have children. Just see what God wants you. Say, well, Brother Bill, you, you just, I, I'm, I'm not good with learning and everything, so there's no way that I could learn another language and go over to some other country to preach in another language. Well, that's okay. You know, there are many countries in this world that their official language is English. You can go to one of them. Or how about this? You can go to another country and teach English using this book as your textbook. China will allow that. China does not allow missionaries into their country, but you can come there and you can teach English to people there, and you can even do it with the Bible. They'll allow that. It, so... You know, there, all these excuses we come up with, God can still use us. Just let him pray. Say, Lord, what will you have me do? Pray like Isaiah said, hear my Lord, send me. Say, Lord, what would you have me do? That's what Paul said when he was on the Damascus road. The Lord appeared to him. And he said, what wilt thou have me do, Lord? Uh, when was the last time you asked that? We need to be willing to be used of God. There is a mission field out there. We, we, the fields are literally white unto harvest. But we tend to just forget about that and get concerned with our own things and just want to go through life. But the world is dying without Jesus Christ. We need to get a burden for that. We need to realize that the Lord has given us a mission and a mission field and we need to go out to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, reaching them before it's eternally too late. There are people that you speak to each and every day that maybe your witness is the last one that they will ever hear. Maybe your testimony is what will make a difference to them or they'll reject it and go off into eternity. But what if we, do, what if we fail to do that? What if we fail to tell them? They're still going off into eternity just without the hope of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, Lord, we need to have a greater burden for reaching this world for Jesus Christ. Just pray that you'd be with us. I pray that you'd help us to honor you with our lives and live for you each and every day, to be a testimony for you. I pray that each person here will pray about what the Lord, what you would have, have them to do, uh, whether it's here locally or somewhere across this world, whether it's to give or to pray or whatever. And I pray that you'd give us a greater burden to pray, to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. It, that's the responsibility that you've given us. Help us to be faithful each and every day to pray, to seek your face, to turn from our wicked ways. And, and Lord, that you might heal our land and forgive our sin. And Lord, most of all, that you would send forth those laborers that people might be saved up unto the end of the world. We love you, Lord. We just commit ourselves into your hands. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Pastor. Okay, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.
saved it. 